Guy Martin wants to recreate a D-Day parachute jump. And to do it, he's helping rebuild one of the last surviving D-Day Dakotas. Today, he'll fit the part that gave this workhorse its legendary reliability, letting it carry 28 paratroopers into battle with ease. That's bloody great, isn't it? Just look at it. Yeah, radial engine. Mission today will fit in the second engine. The first engine was fitted on Monday. We're on Wednesday now. 14-cylinder, um, Pratt & Whitney. Not a massive amount of power for its size. That's 30 litres, but it's like 1,100 horsepower. It's like a truck engine. Never stress, just plugs away, just plugs away. I've heard stories of these, I don't know if you have. We've had cylinders of these missing, blown off in a, in a firefight, um, but they'll still run. Each engine weighs more than half a ton. She's coming. She's coming, man. They were reconditioned by specialists in America at a cost of £40,000 each. Those stanchions have never been on this airframe before, so this might need a few love letters and a bit of caressing, a bit of a gentleman's touch. <laughs> what do you want me here, Rob? Cheers, boss. The engine is attached to the airframe by just four bolts. But the bolts won't slot in until everything is lined up perfectly. A jiggling match, boys. It's a jiggling match. She's teasing us, boy. She's teasing us. Wartime machinery requires a robust approach. One big hit is much better than millions of little ones. Yeah. Yeah, she's in, she's in, she's in. Yeah. There are six months to go before Guy plans to jump out of this plane. Don't worry. Do not worry. That's, they're not going to drop off. I'll tell you now. They are dropping off. With the heavy engineering dealt with, the team can turn their attention to some of the D-Day details. The lead plane of every squadron was fitted with the latest radio technology to help the pilots drop their paratroopers at the correct location. Night Fright hasn't worn this special aerial since 1944. Yeah, what we've got here is the Eureka Rebecca pathfinding system. These fellas here, well, not fellas, because the girls, called Rebecca, and then they would drop a bloke in a field. He'd have a transponder box with him called Eureka. Eureka would talk to Rebecca through beats and beats and, um, like an oscilloscope wave lefts and rights and rights and lefts, and that would get the Dakota going in the right direction until we've got equal waves left and right. That means we're dead ahead, lads out the back, jobs are good. Jobs are good. A secret group of paratroopers were entrusted to deploy the Eureka boxers behind enemy lines, the Pathfinders. I think they trained us to believe that we were quite wonderful. <laughs> They would be the first to land in Normandy on D-Day, operating under the cover of darkness. They made us have carrots, because they said by having a lot of carrots, they said we could see better in the dark. 20-year-old Bob, filmed here, and the other Pathfinders, would have a crucial part to play in ensuring the accuracy of the mass drop. When we got on the plane, there was a lot of joking, but I noticed that it gradually slowed up, and, uh, and then it, people were very quiet. The Pathfinders would have just a 30-minute head start to set up the Eureka radio beacons that would guide the rest of the fleet in. Uh, Spitfire had gone out to see where we were going to land, and it had a photograph to show there were no enemy there. The German camouflage must have been quite wonderful because when we landed, it was like in a, in a wasp nest. Bob had been assigned two bodyguards, but one was immediately shot dead. Under enemy fire, Bob hid amongst the long grass and tuned in Eureka as quickly as possible. Well, first of all, it didn't be, but I was in too much of a rush. I think we were rather anxious to get the real paratroops there. And I found that um, the beep was just very faint. And then it came on louder and louder. Then I could hear the aircraft itself. 
Bob's mission was a success, with hundreds of troops landing safely at his drop zone. But not all the aircraft that delivered them got away. I always remember it was a Dakota. It was on fire, and the pilots just kept going until they did the job. And then they crash-landed, which was terrible, upset, terribly upsetting. The paratroopers saw off the Germans and rushed on to their targets, leaving Bob and the three remaining members of his unit to guard the whole drop zone. Unfortunately, uh, coming towards daybreak, the Germans came back, and that caused us some trouble. They brought a tank in, and uh, one uh, blew me up. My hair got burned, my face got burned, and uh, it just, I just felt dopey. Bob was captured. After his wounds were treated, he was handed over to some of Hitler's most fanatical troops, the SS. Unfortunately, they found out I was a pathfinder. They kept asking, how many units, how many more are coming, where are you going? It went on and on and on. I tried to joke once or twice. That was rather a painful experience. You don't jump, you don't joke with the SS. <laughs> they don't like it. Once you've been hit once, the pain is not so bad the second time. After three days of interrogation, Bob was sent to a prisoner of war camp. From his hospital bed, he worked on the escape committee. 